the longest and most what? Amazing time prophecy. Friends, listen to me. As we have walked through this seminar together, we covered Daniel chapter 1. The story of Daniel taken out of his homeland. We saw victory turn, uh, defeat turned into victory for the power of God. Daniel chapter 2, we saw the great Nebuchadnezzar dream that he didn't know. Jesus took us through that powerful testimony that he wants to be the prophet revealing our future. Chapter 3, Daniel's out of town. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah went into that fiery furnace experience. God said he wants to be our priest. He wants to be our protector. He wants to guide us through the time of the end, as, as Daniel 12 said several times. Chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar's last stand, if I may, when he writes it himself of his own testimony, where he rejected God even after that great warning. He had 12 months to get his act together after Daniel told him the tree dream was about him. He still finally stood on top of his kingdom and said, look at this magnificent kingdom. I pray we don't do that in January when the new president comes. Daniel chapter 5, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson came in and desecrated the holy vessels when the hand wrote on the wall. Daniel chapter 6, Daniel now goes into the Medo-Persian Empire and was elected right underneath, not elected, put in place by the king who saw in the life of Daniel character qualities that no one else had because no one else knew Daniel's God like Daniel did. This is all a message to us individually tonight that Jesus says what I did in the life of Daniel, the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life tonight. That you can have that same value in the mind of God right now. Daniel chapter 7. We went into the Antichrist topic and matched it up with Revelation 13. And now Daniel chapter 8 is a chapter, unfortunately tonight, friends, you're going to see, along with Daniel 9, is talking about Jesus Christ all the way through it. And unfortunately, the Protestant world has taken it and used the very verses talking about Jesus and applied them to the Antichrist. Very few lecturers are talking about this message tonight, and yet it's the most profound error in prophecy lectures on planet Earth tonight. Watch and see. Tonight's message has four parts. We're going to go through the first two very quickly as soon as we can, depending on your knowledge of what we're going to be talking about. Again, it's a very important message. The earthly sanctuary is filled with the coming Messiah so that those children of Israel coming out of Egypt would have hope going through that wilderness experience. That even though it was the toughest time of their life, they had, they had hope to look forward to the coming Messiah. All right? Then it all came to that yearly cycle, the Day of Atonement, we'll get to in a moment. I briefly mentioned, and I hope you remember in the past study of the Bible, that if you were in that camp of the children of Israel, just as God told Cain and Abel to sacrifice the lamb, so were the nation of Israel to sacrifice the lamb individually. If you sinned, you'd get up the next morning, you'd take baby. Anybody know who I'm talking about? That one-year-old lamb without spot and blemish that you raised yourself, that you became very close to, knew and could communicate with it. You'd take it down to the sanctuary. You would lay your head, hands on the head of that lamb. Confess your sin before God. Symbolically, your record of your sin would go from you symbolically into that lamb. Then you would take the dagger out of the priest's hand, slice the throat of baby, because of your sins and watch as that lamb died before you because of your sins my sins the priest would then catch the blood in the vessel the holy vessel carry that blood into the holy place of the temple sprinkle it on the horns of the altar of incense seven times Recording your sins in the holy place that we talked about the judgment, facing the judgment with confidence. 
last evening. Exodus 25 says, the reason God asked them to make a sanctuary is that he may what? Dwell among them. It, is, it has always been Jesus' desire to walk moment by moment with us in the Garden of Eden. But perfect love always gives us perfect choice. According to all that I have shown Moses, after the pattern of the tabernacle, after the pattern of the instruments, thereof even so shall ye make it. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So the sanctuary of the Old Testament, if you want to summarize it all up into one small point, is this. It's a big point, but it doesn't take long to study it, to understand the purpose of the sanctuary is not to leave God's people out in the wilderness, that he can finally dwell among them. Every morning you get up and look out your tent, there was the cloud above the sanctuary. Wouldn't it be great? I mentioned it before, if you could, everywhere you lived, there'd be a cloud over your house. Everybody that believed in Jesus as their personal Messiah, you could see the cloud. Wouldn't that give you joy as you're driving down the road? Ah, there's another cloud. Or driving down the highway, the people who claim to be Christians claim to have Jesus as their personal Savior. A cloud above their car. Wouldn't that be awesome? For some of you. Might be a distraction for others. There's one of those clouds again. What's that all about? That's how much Jesus, who can speak worlds into existence, longs to be with us tonight. Hebrews chapter 9 talks about this experience. If you want to turn there, Hebrews chapter 9. It contrasts the earthly experience versus the heavenly experience. Heavenly sanctuary versus the earthly sanctuary. There's so many texts, literally, you could have a six-month seminar every night unpacking this earthly sanctuary, finding how it parallels Jesus. Hebrews chapter 9, it says, Then verily the first covenant had also what? Ordinances of the divine service. Of what kind of sanctuary? Worldly sanctuary. So he's contrasting back and forth. And it dropped down to verse 22, just for the sake of reference. And verse 22, Hebrews 9, 22, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Without the shedding of blood is no remission. No, no taking care of the sin problem. Jesus took care of that problem. Let's look at, very carefully at this sanctuary, just for the sake of reference tonight. If you came in the courtyard... The first thing you would see would be the altar of burnt offerings. The cross experience where Jesus gave his life for all mankind. Next to it would be the laver where Jesus washes our sins away, where the priest would do a certain cleansing process there. Inside the holy place, which is where the blood of your lamb would be taken as that lamb would be killed. The first piece of furniture on your right was the table of showbread with the 12 loaves that was supposed to be baked fresh every Sabbath morning as an indication of the spe special bread that God gives the preacher on Sabbath. The seven branch candlestick on your left as you, the priest went further into the sanctuary. Here's where the blood would be sprinkled on each corner of the altar of incense where the incense would go up before the curtain separating the holy place from the most holy place. It's all about Jesus. Eight layer thick curtain with angels embroidered in that eight layer thick curtain inside the most holy place was the most holy piece of furniture which was where the shekinah glory was always there as the presence of god representation inside the ark of the covenant was three articles ten commandments aaron's rod that budded and a golden cup of manna that lasted a long time. If you go to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, they have a full-scale model of this sanctuary. The Mennonites have put it up there. It's really a beautiful place to visit. Altar of burnt offerings, laver, inside the holy place, artist conception of the table of showbread, 12, piece, 12 loaves of bread for the 12 tribes of Israel. 
Jesus is the bread of life, seven branch candlestick, altar of incense. That's the one they talked about in Daniel chapter 5 when Babylon fell. Table of showbread, altar of incense, and inside the most holy place is the Ark of the Covenant that only the priests were to carry as it was covered. But there was a priest that didn't obey, and he touched it and died. And his name was Uzzah. Inside that Ark of the Covenant, Aaron's rod that budded, indicating he would be the next leader, the Ten Commandments, and that pot of manna. The lid of that Ark of the Covenant was 33 inches by 55 inches of solid gold. A very holy piece of furniture. Just a little side note. Don't requote me. Just remember this when you see it happen. I believe that Ark of the Covenant is going to be found before Jesus comes. Why? Because atheist says there was no such thing, it's all a big fable, and there was no such thing of Moses and all these children. There's no truth to it. When they find that piece of furniture, it will shut the atheist's mouth. And the most holy place was the place that the priest would go once a year. At the end of the yearly cycle, if I may. It's called the Day of Atonement, or we call it today Yom Kippur. This is all leading us up to this passage in a moment. Jesus is our high priest. He enters into the holy place daily. He enters into the most holy place once a year. The high priest did here on earth. All the furniture of the sanctuary speak of the Messiah. The altar of sacrifice, the cross experience, labor. Jesus washed our sins away. A table of showbread. He's the word of God. The candlesticks. Jesus is the light of the world. Altar of incense. Jesus hears our prayers. And the altar of the Ark of the Covenant is the complete work of atonement Jesus is doing in the courtroom of heaven now. At the end of the yearly cycle would be again the Day of Atonement. It had a three-part service. And in that three-part service, again, they would alter certain sacrifices. Now, we don't have time to go in it completely. As I said before, it would take us many months to dialogue, dialogue about all of it. But this, what took place on this day will have a lot to do with what we're going to discover tonight. In Daniel chapter 8. Leviticus 16, it says, the high priest shall make an atonement for the holy place. So get this, all year long, the blood would be carried by the tens of thousands of lambs into the holy place. Can you imagine the accumulation of the blood they actually had troughs coming out from the altar of incense out underneath the bottom of the curtain where the blood would flow. Sin is a messy ordeal. You know what it's done to your life and the lives of your children. At the end of the yearly cycle, God said, we need to clean the sanctuary. It can't continue. So as you read the sequence of what took place as that high priest did the three steps, there was a time when he would walk in, the temple would be filled with smoke and all of the blood would instantly be clean. There's no record of anybody going in there with sponges and wiping all the blood away. Jesus moved and instantly the blood was gone. And all 1.6 million people outside, the Bible says, was silent. How does that happen? Not even a child was heard crying. Because they heard the high priest going from the holy place into the most holy place. And they actually had bells sewn in the bottom of his garments so they could hear him move through the temple. Because if they did not hear him moving, it was because of their sins that they did not confess. And as he went into the presence of God, sin cannot survive the holy presence of God. That's why God is doing so much to get us ready for when we meet him. Anybody that harbors sin, cherishes sin more than they do their Savior, we all need a Savior to get ready to meet him. And it goes on. 
instructing in verse 18 of Leviticus 16 that he should take a bullock and a goat and sprinkle that blood on the, on the horns of the altar. And then if you look at verse 7, he takes two goats. This is very interesting. Leviticus 16, verse 7, he takes two goats. And present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Aaron shall, what? Verse 8, cast lots. It was almost like drawing straws upon the two goats. One was for the Lord in honor of the sacrifice Jesus made. Again, only the blood of Jesus cleanses the temple. Amen? Okay. But then one is called a unique phrase, a scapegoat. Now, friends, I will admit tonight that there's some controversy within the Christian community, because some of Protestantism believes the scapegoat is representing Christ, and some believe the scapegoat represents the devil, because we'll continue to read and see why as we go on. Aaron shall bring the goat into which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering, which is a representation of Jesus taking care of the sin problem. Verse 10, but the goat on which the lot fell to be a scapegoat shall be presented in what condition? alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. Verse 15, here's what they had to do with that scapegoat. Then shall he kill the goat on the sin offering, not the scapegoat, that was for the people and bring his blood within the veil and do that blood what he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle on mercy seat and, and before the mercy seat. Okay, then you drop down to the third step. There was to be a strong man, verse 20, Leviticus 16, 20, and when he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place, the tabernacle of the congregation, and the altar, he shall bring the what? Live goat, verse 21, Aaron shall lay both hands on the head of this live goat, confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and their transgressions and all their sin, putting them upon the head of the goat, and shall send him away by the hand of the weakest man in the camp. The strongest priest in the Levites had to take this goat out, the scapegoat, out into the wilderness. I've ridden from Mount Sinai down through this area for three and a half hours. There is not a blade of grass to be seen. The only way you could survive in this camp is if you were inside the protection of God and his people. When you were taken outside the camp so far away, and let go, that goat would eventually die. But he would be out in the wilderness for a long time, suffering because he was the scapegoat. There is going to be a time period, we talked about that thousand years, where the devil we put out in darkness because of the sins he caused this world. Okay? So at the end of that process, after they took that, lamp, that scapegoat out and the priest declared all the sins and all the records of sins was taken care of, 1.6 million people would breathe a sigh of relief because the whole yearly cycle would come up on that day and the high priest would represent all the sins of the nation of Israel. All these sacrifices year after year that yearly cycle would go by until the day that Jesus walked down we'll talk more about this Thursday it's powerful presentation in light of prophecy Jesus walked down to the bank of the Jordan John looks up and says these words we want to say them together tonight behold the lamb of God which does what takes away the sins of the world. The reason we didn't bring our lambs tonight or any day you go to the sanctuary, Jesus was the fulfillment of the lamb. Amen? He is our blood sacrifice for our sins. Only Jesus could fulfill all the prophecies leading up to that time period. For Hebrews 9, Paul says, for Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the what? True. But here's where Jesus is. But into heaven itself now to appear. In the presence of God, for what reason? For us. He's doing a work on our behalf right now in heaven. 
John the Revelator saw it. He said, and the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the what? Ark of his testament, Ark of Covenant. And there were lightnings, voices, thunderings, and an earthquake and great hail. John sees it. Daniel sees us. Moses saw it. Don't let anyone tell you there isn't a temple in heaven. Moses saw it. Hebrews chapter 9, Paul goes on and talks about it even further. He says there will be a time when God in the courtroom of heaven will have put away sin. In other words, no longer will sin have an impact on God's people. Can you say amen? Jesus will have done away with all the record of all the righteous. When the last person can be saved, will be saved. He will have put away the sin on planet earth. What he was able to do with those who allowed his blood to take that record. After that, there will be a judgment. The judgment will be wrong set right in the courtrooms of heaven. He will appear the second time, not in a manger, but in the second coming, and all of sin will have been taken care of. Can you say amen? There's a time coming, friends. That's what prophecy is given to us for, to make us aware of the time we're living so that it doesn't catch us off guard. Now, tonight, we're about to reveal something that I hope you never forget until Jesus comes. It's the one prophecy that will prove your Jesus is the Messiah. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. If you're not there, it's page 889. Please turn there. You'll want to get your pencil ready. Daniel chapter 8 and chapter 9. Daniel comes to the place in his walk with his Savior in his walk with the angel, revealing things to him. Listen carefully. He comes to the place where he did not have answers to his visions and dreams. Even the faithful has to have a time when we don't have the answers to strengthen our faith. He's in a condition now where he needs answers because Daniel is wondering what's happening. He asks the angel, how long until we can keep the holy principles you taught us back there in the desert? How long until we can set up the temple again? How long until we can kill the lamb? How long until we can practice the principles of that yearly atonement? Daniel had been captive 70 some years in Babylon, now under the Medo Persian Empire. God's people could not practice their worship. Daniel's pleading with God, How long? And the angel gives him this message in Daniel 8, 14. Read it with me. The angel said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Unto 2,300 days, then shall that sanctuary be cleansed. Now, we already studied in prophecy a day equals a year. So 2,300 days, Daniel's now getting it. It's going to be 2,300 years. If you were a true prophet, if you just heard the message from the angel, and you're expecting the sanctuary to be cleansed soon, Daniel's life of faith was rocked to the very foundation. He didn't understand it. There's no way it could be all of these years. I mean, he was, he was shaken. Look at verse 17. So the angel came near unto me where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid. I fell on my face, but he said, Understand me, O son of man, for that at the time of the end shall be the what? Are you getting it so far? At the time of the end, this vision will come to play. It's not written for your time, friends. 
That's what Daniel got the message from the angel. It's not written for your time, Daniel. It's written for the time of the end. We are in the time of the end. This message ought to be shouted from the mountaintops. Why? Because it's the only prophecy that pinpoints when Jesus would be sacrificed. Now verse 18 says, Now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground, and he touched me and set me upright. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of indignation. For at the time appointed what? The end shall be. So he's telling him, at this time I'm going to reveal to you something is going to begin. The time of the end. This prophecy brings us down to the time of the end when many events would begin taking place. All right, drop down. Verse 26. And may I say, at this time of the end, you will see events begin to take place that took place on that Yom Kippur. If you understand what took place on that time, that, that at the end of the Jewish year, they did that cleansing of the sanctuary. You'll see how important this is tonight. Verse 26, in the vision of the evening and of the morning was told is true. Wherefore, Daniel, what? Wherefore? Say it together. Verse 26, wherefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. So the angel's telling Daniel, it's not going to start in your time. Again, Daniel's living approximately 500 years before Jesus Christ walks on the earth as the Messiah. He's a captive Jew. He lived through the time of Babylon. Sanctuary was destroyed. The furniture was all salvaged, taken off to Babylonian warehouses, put in the warehouses with the other pagan gods until Daniel chapter 5 experiences. We already read about it. Now the angel tells him it's going to be 2,300 years before the sanctuary is restored. And what did he do? Verse 27. And I, Daniel, what? It hit this true prophet so hard he could not withstand it and was sick certain days afterwards i rose up and did the king's business but i was astonished at the vision but nobody understood it he started talking to hannah and i michelle and azariah and everybody he could here is the true prophet that had all the answers before get it tonight friends don't let the devil rob you of your faith when you come to the point in your Christian walk where the answers don't come easy. It's a time where your faith will be strengthened. Your patience will grow in Christ. But don't give devil permission to make you feel like you must have done some great sin. Now God's not communicating with you. No, Daniel had a certain time period. But you know what Daniel did? This is interesting, friends, and it's a message for me tonight. I hope it is for you. When Daniel wasn't getting answers, he didn't get frustrated. He didn't get depressed. He didn't quit stop going to church. No, he didn't have church, but he didn't stop worshiping God. Three times a day, he was predictable, worshiping God in the window of his place. Kept asking God for the answers. Believing God still loved him. Are you hearing me tonight? His value did not diminish. Daniel knew his value in the mind of God. He couldn't understand it. The angel told him something that didn't make sense. Turn to Daniel chapter 9, and as you're turning there, do you know how long it takes to fly from heaven to earth? Don't say it. I want you to think about it. Now, if we're Christians, every answer should come from the Bible. Amen? I'm about to read to you a verse that will tell you how long it takes for an angel to fly from heaven to earth. Okay? Are you ready? You're getting quiet. You're wondering whether I'm going out on a tangent or something. Just a little side note. Verse 21. Before we read it, 
It takes three and a half minutes. That's an interesting time period. How do I know that? Because when you read the entire prayer Daniel prays, the angel finally arrives. And what's the angel say? At the beginning of your supplication, at the beginning of your prayer, God told me to come down here by your side. So that it took him that long. Anyway, look at it. Verse 21. Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of evening oblation, evening sacrifice. Verse 22. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee what? Skill and understanding. Where's skill and understanding come from? God, absolutely. The angel has to deliver it to him. Verse 23. At the beginning of your supplications, at the beginning of your prayers, the commandment came forth. Where's commandments come from? God. I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. What vision? The vision that he's been praying about since Daniel chapter 8. He prayed and prayed day after day asking for answers. And now the angel comes, I finally come to give you the answer that you asked for. Now, Daniel 9, 24. We're going to slow down and we're going to chew on this verse a minute. Because there's some powerful principles that if all Christianity would get tonight, it would unite all denominations. He begins by saying, Daniel 9, 24, how many weeks? Seventy weeks are determined upon what? All right, stop. So can you agree with me? Seventy weeks are involved in the prophecy, yes or no? Yes, the, the angel begins breaking up the 2,300-year prophecy, and the first section he gives him is 70 weeks. All right, now watch this. They are determined, that word determined means cut off for thy people, upon thy people. Who was Daniel's people? Come on, who was Daniel's people? The Jews, absolutely, who were taken captive and in the Medo-Persian Empire at this time and upon thy holy city. So something is going to happen. A limited amount of time was given for the nation of Israel to do what? The following six points. They may seem like they're saying the same thing, but when you dig into the original Hebrew, there's some very unique characteristics to what the nation of Israel was doing and what the angel says they need to stop. And the last one is the most important. Watch carefully. The angel's telling Daniel, you've got 70 weeks. How many days in a, in a um, week? Seven. So 70 times seven. Interesting enough, someone asked Jesus how many times you should forgive sins. What did he say? 70 times seven. He was familiar with this. It was another way of reminding the people the prophecy was wrapping up in his ministry. Watch. The angel says, number one. The nation of Israel needs to stop transgressing. They need to make an end of sins. Now, transgression and sins and iniquity, they're all describing different types of sins, okay? And to make reconciliation. That word means reconnect back to the knowledge of the coming Messiah. Because their sins or their iniquities had broken them off of hanging on to that coming testimony. Why? They were in Babylon, now in Medo-Persia. They were getting comfortable there. All right. Point number four, to be, bring in temporary righteousness. Everlasting righteousness. This is the angel giving the true prophet the message to give to the nation of Israel. Get these things done before Jesus comes. And then, verse 5. Um, point number five, to what? Seal up the vision and prophecy. What vision and prophecy? The 70 weeks. We'll discover what's, what's in it as we go on. And then finally, to anoint the most holy. Who was that? Jesus Christ. To anoint the most holy would be to recognize as a nation of Israel, Jesus Christ as the holy one that would fulfill all the lambs that was ever killed. 
This is what Daniel was told. The nation of Israel had 490 years to do. A lot longer than Nebuchadnezzar. He had 12 months to get his act together. The nation of Israel had 490 years. So here's the question, and this is the tough one, and this is where sometimes the crowd splits. According to that verse, the angel of Gabriel talking to Daniel, was there a limited amount of time for the nation of Israel to get things done, yes or no? Absolutely. And yet where are we looking today? The nation of Israel. This prophecy, my friends, is not being taught. You'll see before we finish tonight, they apply these very verses to the Antichrist. Watch as we continue. There is a very specific time period, Daniel was told, and again, God's people were the holy people, the nation of Israel. He's telling them in advance, I'm giving you special time to get your act together, to get those six points done, determined upon that nation and that nation alone. Now, he's breaking it down, 490 years. There's still a lot of time left. We'll get to that, 1810 years, as a matter of fact. Now, Daniel 9, 25, there, know therefore and understand that from the what? Why is this point important because he's now going to establish when this prophecy began is that important yes or no yes. yes because if you don't know the starting date you can't know where the end date was and you can't know that Jesus fulfilled all these things on the very hour all right watch know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to do what Restore and build Jerusalem. Most people throw that down where the Antichrist is going to reign over in Jerusalem. It's going to, the Temple Mount is going to be destroyed. He's going to set it up again. They use all of these texts for the Antichrist. It has nothing to do with the Antichrist. To restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the... All right. The nation of Israel... Well, let's keep going. I'll build on it as we build the text together. Under Messiah the Prince, that, that phrase means anoint Jesus as the anointed one. There shall be how many weeks? Seven weeks. And what else? 62 weeks until something unique happens for Jesus. Are you following me so far? Yes or no? All right. How do we know when the command was established. This used to be a point of debate with a lot of the theological professors, but friends, we have dug up a lot of cuneiform tablets, those clay tablets. Now the date is not even dialogue because they found the proof of what you're going to see tonight. Ezra chapter 6 verse 14, again, the nation of Israel had seen their major beautiful temple in Jerusalem destroyed many times, but here it goes, when the others who were not Jews established it back again. The elders of Jews built it, and they prospered through the prophecy of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Idu. And they built it and finished it according to the command of God of Israel and according to the command of who? Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, the king of Persia, the Medo-Persian Empire. All right. Now, this gives you a problem, Bible students, because when you do your homework, there's three dates here. The first date, because it's the largest date, coming to the year zero, B.C., 537. The next one's 520. next one's 457. Watch. Cyrus gave a decree. When you do your homework, you'll discover. He gave a decree, but he said only certain Jews could go back and try and reconstruct the temple. Now, friends, if you've ever been to Israel, I know some of you have, those stones are massive, many tons. You can't move them with an average crane, and yet they moved them with ropes and a lot of hard labor. And while they were trying to rebuild the temple, because the previous empires that conquered it tore every stone down, because it's a long story how the gold was melted from the temple and ran down the cracks of stone. They had to tear down every stone of the temple. And so when they're trying to rebuild it, their enemies were coming back and said, we don't want you guys back here again. You're those Jews that are so legalistic. We don't want you back. And they were throwing rocks at them. So they had to set up guards where they were trying to rebuild the temple. Finally, it was such a frustration to them. There's a deep spiritual lesson in that. That they gave up. So Cyrus' decree did not effectively build the temple. They gave up. 
Darius came along and said, look, you guys got to get back to your hometown. You got to get that Jerusalem rebuilt. Your faith is still there. You need to come back as a people again. You're never going to be happy until you do. God moved on these leaders to do it. But only a partial command again. There was something unique about King Artaxerxes, and you'll find the proof of it in Ezra chapter 7. If you turn there, because you want to mark this, this will help you to establish that beginning date of Daniel chapter 8. Ezra chapter 7, in verse 13, page 521. Just put a star beside that passage. You'll see why this command got it done. Or Xerxes says, I make a decree that how many? All they of the people of Israel and of his priests and Levites, watch the details, in my realm, say it with me, which are minded of their own free will. Wherever God's hand is involved, it's always a freedom of choice. It's the devil that forces to go to Jerusalem, go with thee. Now, how does, how does this make it any different? Look at verse 20. And whatsoever more shall be needful for the house of thy God, which thou shalt occasion to bestow, bestow it out of your own account. Ah, oh, do you get it, friends? If somebody told you, you know, your family needs a home, and go ahead oh, down to this certain place, and by the way, whatever materials you need, just go to Home Depot. I have an account there. Here's a card. Charge what you need. I don't think any of us would wait. We'd be out there building. All of the nation of Israel saw this. They all went back, and it took them seven times seven is what? So what's seven times seven? 49 years to finish building the walls. But they did it. Because everybody went back, they couldn't believe the hand of God moving to where they could actually go back and rebuild the city and rebuild the temple. He goes on to say, and I, even I, Artaxerxes the king, do make a decree to all the treasures which are beyond the river that whatsoever as of the priest needs, the scribe of the law of God of heaven shall require of you, give it to him fast. It shall be done speedily. When he comes to the bank, you make sure he gets what he needs and don't put him in a long line. And this guy didn't even he claim to be a, a Jew, a staunch Jew like Daniel was, but he knew God wanted his people to go back. So that, that gives us the exact time period when this prophecy began. All Daniel's doing is writing it down. The angel's breaking it down for him. The decree has now been found. The artifacts have documented this completely to the very day. The nation of Israel now had that 490-year period to begin, according to the command of Artaxerxes, who even paid for that work to be done. Are you with me so far? May I move on? Yes or no? All right. Now, with that in mind, this time prophecy, the date clearly established from Artaxerxes, 70 weeks are the time period given to the nation of Israel, which means something had to happen at the end of that 490 years where the Jews lost that covenant with God. And be careful about this. <laughs> when the Twin Towers came down, I'll never forget it, I was in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Most of you know where you were when that, that day when those towers came down. I was in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and I was doing a seminar like this, and um, the Messianic Jews... No, not the Messianic Jews, the Hasidic Jews, the ones that wear the tablets and still have the garments. You can pick them out in any crowd, especially in a Jewish temple. They're very conservative Jews. They heard we were talking about this topic this night. And so they came. Two whole rows in the back of that big um, conference center where we were holding this series. And when they heard this prophecy, it was like 
they were ready to get up and tear me to shreds. I could see their look change because they thought I was saying all Jews are going to hell because they did not recognize Jesus. And I'm, I must make it clear in every seminar thereafter, because as soon as I finished, they all came up and swarmed around me and they were so mad at me, red in the face. They were, uh, it was only God that held them back from getting up and really being vocal during the message. We are not saying all Jews are lost. What we are saying is God gave the nation of Israel a limited amount of time, but individually every Jew can be in the kingdom of God. Can we agree on that? Every living human being, if they accept Jesus as their personal savior, everyone can be in the kingdom. But it's a choice. But the nation of Israel had a limited amount of time to recognize Jesus. The nation did. Now you go over there, they've got a soccer stadium right there in that holy area of Jerusalem. And on Sabbath, it's packed and they're being just like Americans, entertaining themselves on the Sabbath day. According to the prophecies of Daniel, God's covenant with the nation of Israel would end, according to the prophecies, at 34 AD. An interesting period of time. Why didn't it end when Jesus died on the cross? Jesus told his followers, his disciples, stay in Jerusalem after they kill me. Why? I mean, I would have told the followers, get out of town. They're going to kill you too. No, he wanted to fulfill the 70-week prophecy. He wanted to give the nation of Israel another chance after they knew he was resurrected, after they knew he walked through the city, after they heard the New Testament apostles and disciples stand up at the threat of their very lives in the temple and preach and teach Jesus. Acts chapter 7, verse 59. It wasn't the disciples just decided one day, let's get out of town. No, the Jews themselves ran everybody that believed in Jesus out of town. Thursday night, oh, they stoned Stephen, calling on God, saying he was just a deacon, but he believed Jesus was the Messiah. They stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. 34 AD, Stephen became the first Christian martyr. The Jewish leaders rejected the truth about Jesus, the gospel. So what did they do? Went to the Gentiles. Completed the 70 weeks, 490 years of probation of Daniel's people, as was told. And Saul went on to be called who? Ah, interesting man. Saul was consenting unto his death. Whose death? Stephen's. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church that was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial, made great lamentation upon him. And saw he had made havoc on the church, entering into every house, hauling men and women, committing them to prison. If you said the name of Jesus, your name was on a hit list. If you were baptized, and there was thousands every day being baptized, they were being recorded. And they were being hunted down. Saul going out believing he was doing God's will in the name of God, killing people that believed in Jesus. And when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against these things which were spoken of by who? You see that day when Paul had, Saul had an encounter with Jesus. He loved God. He just did not have as much truth as God wanted to give him. And then he put his own life on the line until finally he was run out of town. Notice, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, say it with me, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, speaking to the nation of Israel, but seeing you put it from you, what? And judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Lo, we what? Turn to the Gentiles. Jesus said this would happen. In Matthew 21, he said, Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be what? Taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. That was fulfilled when they killed Stephen, when 
Saul ran the Christians out of town, hunted them down like dogs, locking them up in prison. All of this was a fulfillment of the 490 years Daniel was told about. The nation of Israel would not allow Christians, believers in Christ, to be in that nation any longer. Matthew 21, 34. Who were the other nation? Who was the other nation that Jesus talked about? Well, Paul says it this way: Even as Abraham believing God, as it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore, say it with me, that they which are of faith. Who's of faith tonight? Come on, raise your hands if you're here because of faith. The same are the what? The same are the descendants of Abraham, the spiritual Jews tonight. Paul says there's no difference between the literal Jew and the the literal Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. He says it in Galatians 3.29. If you be Christ, then are ye what? Abraham's seed, which is the nation of Israel, spiritual Jews, and heirs. In other words, you're going to inherit what the nation of Israel would have inherited. Can you imagine tonight? If as Jesus preached for those three and a half years from the time he was baptized to the time he was killed on the cross, if during that time the nation of Israel said, you know what, he's fulfilling all these prophecies. He's got to be the Messiah. And instead of killing him, they would have acknowledged him as the Messiah. Do you know the nation of Israel tonight would be the capital of the entire world? They would have been. Every nation would talk to the nation of Israel for counsel to find God's will according to the scriptures tonight. It'd be a totally different world, but they didn't. So Paul tells us that if you are a believer in Christ, you are now going to inherit. You are going to be the heir according to the promise. What promise? All of those promises God tried to give the nation of Israel. Now, my friends, having a a new heaven, a new earth, eternity in Christ. All of those promises are now belonging to you because Jesus' blood. Can you respond? For he is not a Jew which is one visibly on the outward appearance, Paul says, but he is a Jew which is one what? What you think about Jesus, what you allow Jesus to do, what you allow the Holy Spirit to teach you according to Jesus' words, you're the Jew. You're the follower of Christ. For as many as are led by the what? They are the sons of God, sons and daughters of God. All right, let's continue on Daniel. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth the command to restore and build Jerusalem, we found that, okay, unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks, seven weeks, Three score and two, 62 weeks, unto Messiah the prince. Until the word prince means the anointed one becomes the Messiah. Why wasn't Jesus anointed into ministry at 12 years old? He was wiser than all the priests. Remember, they were confounded by what he was saying to them. Why didn't he go into ministry then? Because Jesus knew the prophecies. He was not to go into ministry until the prophecy said that he would be anointed as Messiah the Prince. 62 weeks after the walls were completed, he was anointed the very day. You know, that day is one of the few points that's mentioned in the scriptures when Jesus went down to the bank of the Jordan to be anointed into ministry. So friends, tonight only Jesus could have fulfilled these points. Messiah means the anointed one. He was baptized right on time. In fact, the scripture said it's the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, which was exactly 27 AD, which is when Jesus was baptized. Luke 3, 21, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized and praying and heaven was open. The Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him and a voice came from heaven which said, thou art my beloved son. In thee I am what? 
Well pleased. 15th year of Tiberius Caesar was exactly 27 AD. Jesus was baptized on time as the prophecy said he would. Now notice, friends, there's 69 weeks and then there is the what? The 70th week. If you ask most, if not all, Protestant pastors, how much time is between the 69 weeks and the 70 weeks? They will tell you approximately 2,000 years. Now just smile, don't go, what? Where do you get that in the Bible? But realistically, there's not a scripture text anywhere stating that you can pull that 70th week out of that prophecy carry it down and apply it to a seven-year tribulation where the Antichrist is going to rule. And yet that's what they are taught in seminary. It's called the skip theory. The 70th week is separated from the 69 weeks. And it's the only week that anoints, that proves Jesus Christ is and was who he says he was. Do you remember earlier on I told you the devil is doing one thing to create counterfeits? It's to rob Jesus out of every truth in the Bible. That's why those who believe in the seven-year tribulation use the text from Daniel 9 that's talking about Jesus Christ and apply it to the Antichrist, and they don't even teach the Daniel 8.14 prophecy. 70 weeks are determined. It doesn't say 69 and then the 70th is separated. Friends, this information has shocked many pastors from all different faiths that have come here night after night without missing one. And it clarifies a lot. Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Now after this, John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and said what? The time is fulfilled. What time? He went into ministry. The 69 weeks was fulfilled. That's why he began his ministry. He was telling John, John had some concern. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Now, continuing, Daniel 9, 26. And after the 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be what? cut off. So the angel clearly is telling Daniel there's going to be a difference in Jesus' life from this point on. After that period of the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off. He's going into ministry. And he shall confirm the covenant for what? For one week. Listen to me, friends. Look at those brochures. Look at the handouts they've given you where they're talking about the seven-year tribulation. And they will quote Daniel 9, 27, because what they believe is the 70 week, 70th week is carried down. First of all, the church is raptured out. Then the Antichrist goes in, and he sets up his temple mount over there in Israel. He's killing animals for three and a half years. They use this term period here. Three and a half years, he shall confirm the covenant for one week. But watch, in the middle of the week, they tell you the Antichrist brings an end to sacrifices and offerings. Three and a half years after he begins. There's only one person that could bring an end to the sacrifices and offerings that Jesus said to begin with in the beginning. That's Jesus himself when he died on the cross. It has nothing to do with the Antichrist. It was the Catholics that dispatched the Jesuits to get the heat off of that organization back there during the dark, dark ages. They had to come up with another plan, and they did. And that plan was to take this verse, this verse, and apply it to an antichrist in the future. Again, friends, the atheists know what has been done in the Christian world without any biblical proof. It's time God's people stand on the word and appear in the truth, not in something we have made up. 
Jesus brought an end to the sacrifices in the middle of the week, the 70th week. Seven years, literal, in the middle of that week was the moment, the very moment, the very day, the very moment when they were about to kill that Passover lamb. The earth quaked because Jesus died. Tradition tells us in the Jewish faith that the, actually the lamb escaped because of the earthquake. The curtain was ripped from top to bottom, indicating that he brought an end to those sacrifices, but the Jewish priests didn't believe in Jesus. They went out and got another lamb, sewed the curtain back up, and continued their services. Jesus was crucified right on time. He's the only one that fulfilled all these prophecies. That's what the Bible says. Stephen was killed right on time. Saul went out to do a terrible work to the Christian church, but then he had an encounter with Jesus. The temple mound, Jesus wants us focusing on the temple in heaven where Jesus is now. Heaven is a real place, friends. That's what he wants us to understand. The covenant has already been completed in Christ. He's working on our lives now to get us ready for this end of the prophecy. Now, this is very, this is very interesting. Now, some of you may have heard from other pastors and Sunday school teacher, all oh, this 1844 date, that goes back to William Miller. And if you do your homework and go to the Library of Congress in the Washington, D.C., it has nothing to do with the Adventist church because the Adventist church wasn't established until 1863. This was before that, okay? But a number of people, actually six people around the globe was impressed by the Holy Spirit to study prophecy approximately 12 years before this. In the late 1820s, they were all six different people that didn't even know each other around the globe in different countries, was impressed to get the word out and start studying it again. And when they started studying it, they came to the understanding of this time prophecy and how it was leading right up to the early 1800s. And they all came to the same conclusion that William Miller did, that something was going to happen on this date. William Miller was so adamant about not wanting to be a preacher that he prayed to God after he understood that this date was coming. The actual date was October 22, 1844, which was the exact day that these 2,300 years, according to the cuneiform tablets we've discovered now, 18, October 22, 1844, because there is no year zero in the middle. Okay, but listen carefully. So what happened? Go to the Library of Congress, pull up the newspapers of that time period. What you'll discover is people le literally left their crops in the field. They got up that morning, thought Jesus was coming that day. Why? Because the sanctuary would be cleansed. They thought the sanctuary was this earth, and the only way you could cleanse this earth is if Jesus came with his holy fire. Does that make sense? It's quiet in here. Six people around the globe did not know each other. All studying the prophecies came to the same date. All began preaching it. William Miller preached it. Literally, people from all denominations and faiths left their homes. They began gathering five, 10,000 people in large tent revivals. Everybody was convinced that Jesus was coming. The day came and went. Nothing happened. In the comic section of the newspapers, when you pull it up October 22, 1844, in the Library of Congress, they have all the newspapers there on microfiche. You go there sometime and pull it up, you'll see in the comic section, they were making fun of believers in Christ. It got so bad that these people, they didn't attend church, they were just going from house to house, camp meeting to camp meeting, just going for months before this date came. And finally, after it came and went, they were, it was the greatest disappointment that the religious world had ever suffered. They tried to go back to their home churches in their hometown, and you, this is the truth, especially the Methodists, and they, they wanted them to sign documents, met them at the church door. The only way you come in this church because you were part of that movement with William Millerites, the only way you come back in this church if you sign this document that you will never talk about the second coming of Jesus again. 
He said, we can't do that. For every one text talks about Jesus coming as the Messiah, there's eight texts talking about the second coming of Christ. They couldn't do it. And so they called them Advent believers, long before Seventh-day Adventists. Advent believers, because the Advent just means the second coming of Christ. So these were people from all different denominations, so they couldn't worship in their churches. Where could they worship? They started having small home groups, worshiping in barns, various different places. But they were spending more time in the Word than ever before. They were convinced something had to happen on that day, and it did. There was a time when Jesus' regular recording of all the angels' works, of all the righteousness that was being done, all had to come to a place where Daniel saw it, John the Revelator saw it, Ezekiel, Jeremiah saw it. There was a time when God's people were not in heaven, but every name of God's righteous has to be called up. Why? The angels have to be convinced that everybody that goes to heaven at the second coming are safe to save. There cannot be any doubt in one holy angel's mind as they come down to take God's people home. Otherwise, there would be confusion at the second coming. And there, no, there is no confusion. They're singing songs of joy. I told you there's three judgments in the Bible. You can see over here on your right whiteboard tonight. The first judgment is just what I talked about. And this date, I believe, is the date of what happened in October 22, 1844. Ezekiel says the throne of God is on wheels, wheels within wheels. He moved from the place where the angels record all the books and all the sins and all the blood of Jesus. He moves from the place of recording the sins, may I say the, mo the holy place, into the most holy place. It's a work that only Jesus can do. And what is he doing? Daniel says the judgment was set, the books were open, and the thousands of thousands ministered under him. The angels are witnessing. Let's say the name of Cain is brought up. If he never confessed his sins, Abel did. He did what God told him. Jesus will say, my blood. Abel's name remains in the book of life, and they move on to the next one. The angels say amen. That's why the angels say the works have been made manifest to us. We read it in Revelation 15 last night. This first judgment is going on right now. And friends, there's coming a day very soon where the last person, only God the Father knows, when the last person can be saved, will be saved. And the books will be closed. Jesus cast his censer down the courts of heaven and says, it is finished. Now listen carefully. In a coming night when we study the plagues, you're going to see where there's some danger involved. The devil wants us to believe that we're going to be raptured out before any plagues fall. And if that's the case, my friends, many people aren't getting ready. And the Bible says there's a great falling away. In other words, believers will fall away in the last day. Paul says it. There'll be a great falling away. Why? Because when the plagues begin falling and they're still here, they're going, oh, no, I wasn't good enough. The seven-year tribulation, we will talk more about that when we talk about the plagues coming up on Saturday night. I promise you, friends, Jesus says no plague shall come near your dwelling. I thought I'd hear an amen. He will send his angels to have charge over you to keep you in all your ways. That's what the Bible says. But that doesn't mean we're raptured out. It says we shall see them all around us falling as the plagues take on the ones who are trying to kill God's people. See, friends, if you believe you're going to be raptured out beforehand and you're still here, you'll lose your faith. Unless you know that there will be people, God's people here. The second judgment is when God's people go to heaven with Christ on the cloud. And for a thousand years, we are examining the records of those who we thought would be in heaven that didn't make it. Why? God must be able to reveal that he is righteous. Not only to the holy angels that's up there now, but to us when we get there. 
God is a God that wants to reveal exactly what he has done so there's no room for doubt ever. And then the third judgment. You will be able to witness when all the wicked are resurrected. Revelation 20 verse 15 says all the rest of the dead live not again until after the thousand years are finished. The, re the resurrection of the dead right there, then there's a short season as we talked about it. Great white throne judgment where all the wicked will finally receive their punishment. That is the last judgment. Setting wrongs right. The judgment that's going on now, a very holy work, because very soon your name will be called up in the courts of heaven. The books will be open. And every time we said yes to Jesus, instead of choosing sin, Jesus is going to say, see what I was able to do in their life? And he will mark redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. All your sins will have been forgiven. Amen? Jesus has a plan. He confirmed the covenant. In other words, he told his disciples he would do exactly what he did. He is a fulfillment of it all. The verses predict that the Messiah would die or be crucified on the 14th day of the first Jewish month in the year 31 AD, just as he was. The very moment was fulfilled in Christ Jesus. And the devil says, you can't understand that Christian world. I'm going to take that 70th week down and throw it and apply it to the Antichrist. So try to find a verse if you take Daniel 9 out of it. Try to find a verse which backs up Jesus and who he was and how he died on time. You don't have it. Cleansing of the sanctuary is when Jesus opened up the books and judgment was set in that most holy place of judgment in the courtroom of heaven. And soon your name will be called out because you believe in Jesus. And your records will reveal that you let him do what he wanted to do. Now, all of these dates, all these appointed times were found in the Word. Can we agree? Yeah. All of them, every one of them. All of these events were named in the Scriptures. Right on time, Jesus fulfilled all these events. And therefore, the end date, October 22, 1844, whether we like it or not, had an appointed time from the angel Gabriel to Daniel for us to receive tonight. Jesus said through the angel, through Daniel, it's written for our time period. Why? That we don't live like every other generation before us. We know we're living in a holy time. When you look up the tribulations text from the Strong's Concordance, this is what it says. In the world you shall have tribulation. Be of good cheer. Jesus says, I have what? And so he wants to do it in you. You must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Don't think we're so good that we get the rapture out before that time period. He said he's going to carry you through. His angels will have charge over you. Romans 8, 35, we shall, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? So honestly, you will go through it. I mean, friends, come on. There's Christians killing Christians right now. The last time I was in Kenya, over 5,000 Christians died at the hands of their fellow Christians. Some of them were their own denominations, killing their own denomination because they were different tribes. How can we tell and preach to Africa that the church is going to be raptured out before the tribulation when they're already seeing it? Our faith doesn't hold water when we teach the errors that have come in from that dark ages time. Paul says, and not only so, but we glory in tribulation. That means we will reflect the character of God when we get in tribulation. Knowing that, here's the part God's still working on me. Come on, say it with me. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience. In other words, you want patience, you've got to go through tribulation. Oh, but not the great tribulation. Remember, that's already happened when the Jews ate their own children. Jesus says there would never be another time like it was in 70 A.D. That great tribulation, such as never was, already happened according to the Jewish historian. Rejoice in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant 
in prayer. Who comforts us in our tribulation? Paul says, God does. For verily when you, we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know. And John says, I, John, and also your brother and companion in tribulation. I read you these texts, because anybody talks about seven-year tribulation, friends, ask them where they get that from. Now, Revelation 7, verse 14. We're going to talk about the 144,000 the whole last week. These are they that came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes, made them white in the what? The blood of the Lamb. There will be a special group that goes through those final hours that will be a unique group. Daniel was told again, 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So this prophecy, I hope it's clear enough to you tonight. You may not have gotten all the details, but know this. Jesus fulfilled the 70th week. Without that prophecy, without that week, you don't have any proof or any reason to believe he was the Messiah. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. I will not blot his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before the Father, before his angels. John saw it. Daniel saw it. Moses saw it. All of the prophetic writers looked into heaven, saw the courtroom of heaven. That's why the angels tell us in the last days this message must go forth, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment, when he's doing that holy work in heaven, is now. It's come. But here's the good news. John says, my dear children, I write to this so that you what? Is he calling us to be like Christ, yes or no? Yes, so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, come on, say it with me. We have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, and his name is the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only, come on, this is the good news. This is what we have to tell others. Not only for ours, but also for who? For who? Everybody. Everybody. Jesus has paid enough price that anybody that will look onto him and say his name and believe who he is, they can be there. True story, we're going to see on Friday night. Is that right, Peggy? Friday night, Luther. No, that's next Thursday. All right, we're showing a two-hour movie on next Thursday on Luther, Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, the Catholic priest, Luther. He went to bed one night, and he used to struggle a lot with guilt not understanding the gospel as he did toward the end. And as he went to bed one night, he tells the story of the devil coming to him in a dream. And as he was dreaming, the devil had this scroll in his hand. And on that scroll was a record of Martin's sins. And as he unrolled that scroll, Martin's lying there on his bed and the devil saying, how dare you think you can be a Catholic priest? Look at what you have done. You're supposed to be a more holy person than everybody else and look at these sins. And he'd point out the first one. Sure enough, Martin looked at that small print because there were so many of them. And as he read it, he remembered the very moment when he did it. And the devil said, see, how can you do it? Don't you feel like you're the worst? And then he'd go into the next one. And it, before long, Martin said he just felt like he wasn't worth anything. And he started believing in the devil because he was listening to him. Are you hearing me tonight? And finally, that still small voice whispered into Martin's head, what's under the devil's hand? For he saw the hand of the devil was covering up something. And devil's saying, don't worry about that. Look at what you're doing. Come on, you know this is truth. You want truth. I'll give you truth. Look at what you have done. And finally, Martin just, 
he knew the power of God was calling him to do it. And he said, in the name of Jesus, remove your hand. I want to see what's under your hand. And when you say the name of Jesus, all hell trembles. And the devil moved his hand. And those words came out in big, bold letters. The blood of Jesus has paid the price for Martin's sins. And the devil disappeared. Tonight, my friends, yes, Jesus is doing a holy work in the sanctuary of heaven. But don't let the record of your sins bury your faith. Because our creator God is much more powerful than the devil. But at the same time, sin is a real issue that Jesus can only take care of if we give him permission. He's willing to take care of it all, but we can't hold back. There's no time to hold back. There's no time to take detours. There's no time to play games of the red button in our lives. Jesus paid it all. And he says, just give me your all. I'll give you a brand new life. I'll give you a brand new beginning. I'll give you truth. It'll truly set you free. You'll never have to hide from this holy truth again. It will make sense to you. And regardless what church people go to, you'll be able to share with what you understand. And it will give them light that only the Holy Spirit can give. That's what God wants. God, Jesus left this earth praying for unity amongst his disciples. And until he was resurrected, there was no unity. If Jesus can walk with dedicated men who thought they were doing God's will, the 12 disciples, and Jesus couldn't bring unity, how are we ever going to find unity unless we see that blood in our lives? Unless we see the blood has paid the price for our sins. But at the same time, he has you on his mind. And the angels are watching us as we walk every day of our lives. The cloud of witnesses are watching us. Are we going to say yes to Jesus? Or are we going to play with his back and forth doubt or salvation? Those words ring in my mind. Choose this day choose this day whom i will serve but as for come on as for me and my house we will serve the lord i promise you friends jesus is coming soon bring a friend friday thursday night they'll love you for it sing scott why he whom angels worship should set his love upon the souls of men Oh, why as shepherd he should seek the wanderers to bring them back they know not how nor when. I cannot tell how silently he suffered As with his peace he graced this place of tears Or how his heart upon that cross was broken The crown of pain to three and thirty years but this I know, he heals the brokenhearted and stays our sin and calms our lurking fears. 
And lifts the burden of the heavy laden And so the Savior, Savior of the world is come I cannot tell how all the lands will worship when at his bidding every storm is stilled Or oh, who can say how great the jubilation When all our hearts with love for him are filled But this I know the sky shall sound his praises Ten thousand, thousand human voices sing And earth to heaven and heaven to earth will answer At last the Savior, Savior of the world is king at last the savior savior of the world is king Heavenly Father, tonight it's a privilege to know that we are the people that you have called. You've chosen us all to stand in a holy place, a place that has been marked in time as the time of the end. And to be a people that will go through a confusing age of many different beliefs and systems of belief and be able to finally say, lo, this is our God. We have come, he has come to save us. Tonight, Father, as we have come this far by faith, we thank you again for the holiness of your word and that it truly doesn't contradict itself. It reveals moment by moment as we spend time with you and as we have a night off, give us time to meditate upon what we've learned and just come to your throne of grace that will bless us individually that finally when we finish and we see the clouds roll back like a scroll and look into the face of jesus we will see what you are leading us to until that time give us wisdom to know who to invite third